All right, first of all, thank you very much, everyone, for coming today and coming to this session. There are other sessions available. And thank you very much to Mike Burrows for inviting me. It's a, it's a great privilege. Um, so a few things about the talk. Uh, we've got fixed time for this talk. The counter over here. And we have variable scope. So depending on how much the scope we get through, it will depend on the level of engagement we want around the content that we get through. So apart from these two dependent events at the top, credentials and the, and the bottom, and finally, there's no fixed path through here. I've, take, I've set the talk up around these three, set these three principles from uh, the, uh, the Kanban in Action book. So we can, we can, depending on where we want to go, we can dive first into visualize, limit width, or manage flow. Um, Part of the reason for doing this is to keep our batch sizes small. So we're going to we can, we can work on it, look at it a little bit, have some questions, have some back and forth. Um, and I'll, as such, I'll take questions throughout. I'm not going to batch up questions and have them at the end. I'll take them throughout. So please feel free to ask questions, interrupt. If I'm talking too fast or talking too slow, give me the feedback now rather than at the end, and, and we'll, we'll see where we end up. Um, I'm a great believer in the rule of two feet. So if you're not getting anything out of this session, it's not for you. There are other sessions available. However, the options to go to those other sessions will expire, and it's up to you to decide when you're going to, when's the, when, of course, it's a bit like waiting for a bus, isn't it? But you, you get the idea. Okay, so first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am, um, and then we'll get into the talk proper. So my name's Chris Young. On Twitter, I'm World of Chris, uh, and I work for a uh, digital product strategy, service design, and engineering company called Friday, or We Are Friday and for my colleagues here uh, in front. I've only just joined here. Uh, this is my first kind of sort of play around with Kanban here. Previously, I've used it at Base79, who are a um, YouTube multi-channel network. Before that, with the one and only Dan Brown at UU. Um, now, if you want to play along at home with the talk, it's available on, uh, on GitHub. Um, but please, if you do, no spoilers for the rest of the audience if you decide to jump ahead. So what's the, the, the point of the talk? What's the, what's the purpose? The purpose is to test the hypothesis that Kanban empowers you to take individual act, individual responsibility to act on the system. So it gives you tools, principles, methods that you can use to, to, to improve the system and to improve the work. Um, it's, not just, it's not just about empowerment. Empowerment can just end up being local optimal. You can just end up doing something yourself really well, but doing it in isolation. So it's, the, it's that balance between the individual responsibility and, and acting on the system. So, to begin, where would we like to go first? We can visualize, limit, whip, or manage flow. I might have a volunteer to, to direct Manage flow. Manage flow, fantastic, okay. So, can somebody tell me what this is? Airport. An airport, what's happening at the airport? Q. So this is an example of flow not being particularly well managed. So we have a lot of people in the queue here who have, uh, who have no idea when they're going to get to the head of the queue. They know what, the, they know what should happen at the end. Um, but they, something that gives you an indication of the fact that this queue is not being particularly well managed. This is the queue I was in a few weeks ago when I was going on holiday. It says an expediter. There's an expediter scurrying around at the front, shouting out, anyone from Munich? Anyone from Munich? And then a few people who near the back of the queue say, yeah, yeah, they'll drag them to the front and make sure they get on the plane. So, this is and this to me looks not dissimilar to um, the kind of the kind of cues I see, where you have a large portfolio of projects all coming in to use a, a, a limited resource of, of, of IT or, or engineering. There's, there's a lot of people turning up. There's a, there's a massive demand, but there isn't particularly clear management of how that how that demand gets to the resource. And also, typically, the resource is at 100% utilisation, probably more than 100%. There's absolutely no no spare capacity. I mean, there's, there's, there's various approaches you can take to this, and, and there are others who have, have written and spoken much better about this than I have. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to sort of dip into a few things on here. Um, so we've got three subjects we can look at here. We can look at limiting batch sizes, limiting queue sizes, or how managing flow helps you predict throughput. So can I have a, a volunteer to suggest the path we take next? Batch sizes. Batch sizes. So who can tell me what this is? Coffee is close. It's a. It's a, anyone. Any other takers? Yeah. It does look like actually uh, somebody in the rehearsal says it looks like beer. It's actually fresh apple juice, but it's not just fresh apple juice. It's actually four batches of fresh apple juice, because the juicer, 
that you use to make. That's, that's, that's a batch. So when you go to all the trouble of making your fresh apple juice. I mean, I have some fresh apple juice, fantastic. And you get that. Um, so the method you use to get to that delivery of value is this. You have to take an apple. You have to peel it. Please go to the goats. Um, this is again for my holiday. Basically, this is my holiday snap. <laughs> <laughs> it goes into the juicer, and out comes your juice. Now, my son uh, wanted fresh apple juice when we were on holiday, and I saw how labour intensive this was, and I thought, do I really want to do a whole glass of this before I get my feedback, before I know whether he's going to drink it? So I said, look, can you just try a little bit, just have a little bit? No, absolutely not. I was talking to a seven year old. There's, there's no point. I was, I was getting. I was wasting my time. <laughs> so, uh, we then got the feedback. So we went through the cycle four times and we got the feedback. And the feedback was, no thank you, it wasn't very nice. <laughs> so, the point I'm making here, it may be slightly later, is that if, if you can engage the customer to get their feedback early on, even if they, even if they may have very good reasons of their own for batching things up, and often you do, with, I do a lot of work with, bank, with a bank now, um, Things have to be batched up at the point of delivery because the transaction cost of deploying to the banks and is very high. But there's a lot we can do to, to manage flow up to that point. I just wanted to say something about shaping demand, and this will probably carry on. We're down to 39 minutes now. Shaping demand? Yeah. So, um, the hotel where this uh, behemoth lives, um, they also provide apple juice, but they are aware that uh, apple juice is a much easier sell. Um, sorry, orange juice. Orange juice is much easier to sell than apple juice. And they have invested, committed, they, to infrastructure for the provision of orange juice. Um, and they make it apparent that this orange juice is plentiful and available, and actually it would be a lot less hassle if you had orange juice. Um, <laughs> so, I don't know, this is your WordPress website, this is your, um, I think your own closure crazy thing. So, you see why. So, we have exhausted everything is there. Any questions on the batch sizes before we move on? Any comments or observations? Yes? Any tips for finding the right batch size? Suck it and see. Uh, actually, the best batch size is one. Um, <laughs> it's really, uh, don't be afraid to wind it down to the point where it stops working and then ramp it back up again. There's a bit further on where I talk about the, um, where I found really small batch sizes being most effective is in, um, is in uh, review. So where you have, particularly if review is something that people do as an activity when they would otherwise be programming and they'd rather be programming. But we'll come to that. That's um, Burroughs. When I never think of my Burroughs, I always think of Major Burroughs from Super Mario Galaxy. Anyone ever have the same thing? Q sizes, do some Q sizes or using or managing flow to predict uh, throughput. Predict throughput. Predict throughput. Balls. So, um, previously, previous methods that I've been exposed to to, to involve in predicting fruit that have either involved story points or man hours and things like that. Um, I've not found this to be particularly useful. The, the, the um, man hours one, because of the non linear nature of software development, um, asked Dan Brown to talk to you about man hours and uh, man hours as a, uh, as a metric, but basically, the face says it all. Um, Story points, well, let's not get into that, but it's, there's a, there, the relationship between story points and the actual, the, um, the actual time it takes to deliver something is it's variable to say the least. Through, but I have found to be pretty, pretty reliable. Two things about it though, one, it's non-linear. So the, the, the classic SQL you see here, we're, we're slow out of the gates and then we, we, we hit our strides with some interesting exceptions, which we will come into. Um, and you can then use that to say, <coughs> To, to, to predict for another project. So if this was a project that I was involved in, in about a year ago, and I posted this on the camera and dev mailing list um, for some example data. And if we were just, in order to, to provide the throughput, the, predict the throughput for the, the next project, I just did very straightforward. I said, well, what's the average throughput of the last one? That it wasn't quite the same team, it was similar but not the same software, so it's all a bit kind of, yes, there's an algorithm, but you need to apply some heuristic to it. If you were if you if you were going to net out here, you need a, a, an average throughput of 2.4 um, uh, features a week. If you're managing your flow, you're far more likely to get predictable throughput because you're not have things stuck in, in states waiting to go through. The actual project turned out like this. So it actually follows the same S curve pattern down here, 
starts to diverge here. Now, um, we'll come into the reasons for that when we look at the, um, I can't remember where it is in, in the slides. The problem with doing a, a, a sort of rhizomic um, presentation rather than a linear one, you forget where you put the various bits. But the, the, I think there were some process improvements we got of doing this project, particularly to do with the way we manage customer approval that gave us that. Can anyone guess what this is here? I'll give you a clue, this was around the end of the year. Christmas <laughs> <laughs> holiday, exactly. That's good for holiday. So, throughput. There was no throughput for two weeks in December because Christmas holiday. So, again, you need to take these things into account. You need to think about the, the operating context of these things. Um, oh, yes. So, this was the, this was, I think, is something. I need to dig into this data a bit more, but I think this is, this is some indication of why we got a, a bit of an uplift. Um, the, this will make more sense, yeah, this is a problem with doing these things not in a non linear way. This makes more sense when you look at the old CFD, I did put the link on here. The, you can see this uh, review queue here is, is, doesn't get too big, and this customer approval queue here, which was something we introduced, this customer approval was getting out of hand, um, is, uh, very, is, is a lot smaller. It's very bad here. We have real problems to get up with to begin with. And this is why visualising your cues is half the battle. As soon as you can say, look, there's all this stuff and it's waiting for you to approve it. And then it's waiting to be put live. You know you have a problem and you can actually even, you can talk about that. Um, but then we get into a reasonably smooth flow. We do have problems with, with um, deploy. These were down to, we just like using Elastic Beanstalk in AWS and we had not got our, we haven't really got our head around it properly. We haven't got a lot of trouble with that. So it meant that we, ha we haven't yet got to the sort of low transactional cost nirvana of AWS, which is why you see these kind of steps going up like that. Uh, which takes us to the Q side, which is all we've got left here. Or we can go back to the top, to the three tiers at the top. Where would you like to go? Q side. Q side. So, oh, you see, this is the slide I showed you before. So this was the... Um, the, the old, the, the original project. So there's a few interesting things about this. First of all, all this open stuff, God knows when that's going to do it, but just it's, it's, it's endlessly, it's, that stuff is really in the wild. It's not kind of, we use sort of a, a sort of a factory metaphor. It's raw materials that haven't been yet released into the factory. But the person who's raised the Jira ticket or had the idea may well think, they may well think that they can meet it. And indeed, this was the case often that, well, I put a ticket into Jira and when am I going to see it? It's not, we haven't yet started actually managing its flow. It's this completely unmanaged flow in the wild. These horrible big purple blocks here are, are where customer approval wasn't working. And we see this more, uh, apparently, if we take, up, take out all the, all the cumulative flow, just look at, just look at the throughput. So this was, the, uh, this was throughput, this was customer <coughs> approval. So this is where we would be if the work that was, that was in customer approval was done. We'd get, we'd get that uplift. Um, and by presenting this graph to the customer, saying, look, we really need your engagement here, we really need you to approve this work, otherwise we're going to sit down here. We did close the gap. And then we got really good at doing our customer approval on a daily basis and saying, look, we have some new work for you. Get it through, get it through. It wasn't always good. I extrapolated to go to ones around a bit. But we highlighted this problem, made it really clear there's no point in us doing the work unless we could finish it, unless we could get some, some time with the customer to say, is this what you asked us to do? And to Mike Burrow's point, Major Burrow's point, again in, the, in his talk about how having that agreement to sit down with the customer when the work came out of the machine meant that you had ongoing engagement with them. You wouldn't wait to get to customer approval to say, hang on a minute, it's supposed to be this. So, you, so it, it, it encouraged that kind of habit and behaviour. Uh, so I think that's everything from um, managed flow. So we have visualize and limit width. I say managed flow is the one I was most worried about, so I'm glad to have got that out of the way. Sorry, I was going to ask a question. Just go back, Chris. Please so say yes. On, on your CFD1, you had that massive ramp up in the open tickets. Uh, Less so on CFD2. Yeah, let me find that. That was in the Q something. Yes. How. What have you done to change that part of the picture? Uh, oh, we hired a product manager. <laughs> That's true. 
And they were, they, they were then, um, it, was, it wasn't just a free for, oh, I've got a good idea, I've got a good idea. It's like, well, look, let's not even, let's not even have the, 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 the overhead of tracking the stuff in Jira when um, it's not, you know, it's not that. You, oh, you could, uh, I, I don't get too upset about a lot of stuff over here if it is just the, the classic, a reminder to have a conversation about something. As soon as you're actually investing some real time and effort into requirements capture or time to, requirements of trawling, which is a lovely word from user stories of product, absolutely fantastic use of vocabulary, then I start to get antsy because then we're actually investing. Whereas here it's just, hey, what about cars that run on cheese? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, great, put it in Jira. <laughs> Any other questions before we go to, um, that's a closing, closed, closed way of saying it. Any other questions? Who would like to ask a question before we move on to the next part of our adventure? Uh, anyone playing on at home? Do you want to see the test? We'll do those at the end. I was wondering, actually, the, uh, the cumulative flow diagrams, are they from Minecraft? <laughs> <laughs> and that, I want to see. I want to see um, cumulative flow diagrams in Minecraft. That would be so good, wouldn't it? There's a challenge for the... Uh, it's for my son. Can somebody get that done for the UK conference in November? <laughs> So we now have uh, visualize and limit width. Where should we go now? Visualize. <coughs> visualize. So visualize is often the sort of classic starting point for, for using Canva. Um, who doesn't know what this is? Any ideas? Sorry? Peas. Peas. No. Ele is something through an electron microscope? Yes. Any, any advance on that as to what it might so, be? So very close, very close. It is something on the surface of, of a of metal. Can metal? <laughs> no, it's, it's data on a hard disk. So there's a great bit in um, in Flow, Don Ryanson, Don Ryanson's um, book, uh, about it, he quotes an HP engineer who said, "Our work is invisible. What we create is data on hard disk, and we have some very big hard disks." So visualizing is a it, it's key. It brings the it allows us to actually start talking about the work rather than the, the, the workers or the or, or, or effort. And you know, Canva was a fantastic place to start. This is the Canva board for this talk. I can actually show it, I can show it live as well. Uh, yes, so here is the, the live Canva board. Um, oh, I'm doing this now. Right. Um, and while we're here, let's have a quick look at the CFD. And this is very um, uh, right, so the CFD, uh, that's the run-up to the tour. That's the weekend, right? That's a mad panic this morning to put more things in. That's like doing your homework on the bus. Um, <laughs> that's all I've I'm looking at completely the wrong place. Uh, there we go, right here. So, Kevin, what fantastic, and other people have written and spoken about this far more, far, far more deep and better than I have. It tells you the state of work currently, and it tells you what's immediately on the horizon. What I find it doesn't do is give you a, a view of the whole, a view of what, of what it is you're working um, towards. Now, there may be a very good reason for that. It may be that you don't know what that whole is, and it's a, it's a, it's a function of, of limiting batch sizes and, and thinking in terms of options rather than commitment. But you, you don't have that. You don't have some glorious five-year plan or Megatron 5000 you're gonna build. You're only looking sort of so far ahead. But you, my experience has been that you do have a, a bit more visibility than just what's in the queue. And what I love for those are story maps. So who's, who's used story maps? Who's, who's used them and would, and would use them again? I think they're fantastic. They're just a real, they're such a help because they, they, they break you out thinking of things in, in a linear way and stop you getting into, into store, but the endless marching cars going off into the, into the distant place and the other sorts of apprentice. So the way a story map works, is you, you call out the activities that somebody needs to, to, to use your, do with your product, um, and then, you, and then you, you identify the tasks or the features that they're going to need to support that. So the idea is you get to this top line as quickly as possible, so you get the absolute bare minimum working end to end, so that you can support the activities required for your product to actually provide some value, and then you can start to elaborate and kind of work off that spine and put more things in. So what I did was, um, take that idea and make it stateful. So this is a product I worked on about six months ago. And it's for a, it's for a, a website that is supposed to uh, get prospects in, 
present them with a whole load of analysis and data of, of, of some, some, fit, some properties that they have, um, and then say, ah, and you should buy this, or and you should get these consultancy services from us. So first of all, they have to find the site, then they do stuff on the site, and finally they transact and, and the company makes some money. When I came to look at this project and put, and put this in place, um, what I immediately discovered that there was a, an awful lot of activity around here, a lot of elaboration of features here that you would never get to if you didn't know how to find a bloody site in the first place. Also, nobody in technology was thinking about finding the site, marketing was doing that. So we sat down with marketing and started working really well with them. Fantastic designer, fantastic marketer, and there was a, I had heard Goiko Adzik's words ringing in my ears that often you discover that a solution to a problem is not a technology problem, it's a marketing problem, and it can be so much cheaper with marketing than with technology. Plus, there's no way to buy stuff at the end, so it's a bit like having a, 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 a shop down a dark back street somewhere with no till in it. So we immediately identified that we would have to get some stuff done up here and some stuff done up here before elaborating further here. So that's more features. Oh, and so and the staple bit. Right, so the red stuff to do, orange in progress, green done. So it's essentially it's taken the, the, the Kanban visualization and mapped it onto the story map. And the little um, orange things are the advertisement, the people's names, so so-and-so is working on, on this. So more features emerge. Uh, great, we've actually started cracking some of this stuff. Um, there's still, I mean, we've got a better idea of what needs to do up here. But my God, have we got a lot of stuff sitting over here. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Get me behind me, Satan. Um, right. Uh, so, there's still, still a lot of stuff going on here. I think my suspicion here was that this is the shiny stuff that looked nice. It's like, oh, you can draw this sort of graph, and you can do that sort of thing, rather than you can transact or you've done the search optimization, or you've got the person, the, the, the thing that says placeholder video is now actually a video, and things like that. So there were more, more features uh, emerging. The only drawback of this is the high transaction cost of changing the city notes. From, <laughs> so when I came to Friday, I thought I'm going to try this again, but I'm going to take a slightly different strategy. I'm going to use little colored dots. So I'm going to have a vanilla post-it note color and put little colored dots on it. So again, very similar to the, the marketing technology split that the, that the Stateful Story Map um, highlighted and addressed. When I looked at this project, the team who were responsible for the spine of stories at the top only knew about this right-hand side of things. When I asked them about the things towards the said, no, no, that's another team that do that. Said, right, bring them in. We're now all going to work on this, and we're all going to work not on your bit of the system, but on how do we get to the spine. We also discovered if we were going to do this, we were going to have some infrastructure dependency, so to bring them in as well. So we've now got a cross-functional team. We've got the team working on the, the top tier of functionality, the team providing the infrastructure below that, and then the, 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 the cloud layer that the infrastructure, the virtual infrastructure sits on. This was, I had, had massive flashbacks to you view with this, because this was UI, uh, middleware, web services. So often you do have a, a situation where you, you aren't just one team, you have got other teams that to, and having a, a shared visualization, not just of the, the map of the world, but also the state that things are in, uh, is helpful. But it's missing a fundamental point, and the fundamental point is why are we doing this? So it doesn't, none of that, we can still build that and deliver it and have, you know, why do we do that? My, who's heard of impact maps? Fantastic. Who would like me to just dip into a quick, this is what an impact map is before I go into this? So this is Joy Kardzik's uh, invention. Actually, fantastic. I was lucky enough to do a two-day workshop on Spec by Example when he was still emerging this, and it was called Effect Mapping. The idea is that you don't start with what we're going to build. You start with why we're we doing this. So in this example, it's a, an online game platform where they want to get to a million players. So then you say, the next thing you say, you don't then say, uh, what are we going to do to get to our million players, or how do we get to our million players? So who is going to help us? This is absolutely critical key. This is the, the identifying who's the person that's actually going to be engaging with your, with your, your product or service or working against you to get to this. And then, I think that's the genius bit of that map, is that it says who. Um, then, again, we're still not going to what you want to do. We say, how are they going to help? We haven't written a line of code. We haven't even thought about technology. This is going to be the marketing versus engineering thing. Finally, 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 what are, what are we doing? Well, in this case, we're going to, uh, in order to get to our one million players, 
the player's going to post about the game using our, our, our achievements mechanism. So we only get to that once we've qualified it. Now I do, because I like impact management so far, so much, and because I find them quite the guide, I do have a tendency to, to become subject to the availability um, heuristic with them. Which is, who's heard of the availability heuristic? So the availability heuristic is where you, you, you're asked a question, and rather than answering that question, you give an answer to a different question that you just happen to have, have to have. So you give a, a, a simple one. It's from, um, I came across it through, um, I have to pronounce the guy's name right, through uh, Kahneman or Kahneman's thinking, uh, thinking Fast and Slow, which is it's, it's an astonishing book. It's a, it's a really, it really uh, that's a talk in itself. So with the... Um, Chris, could you give an example? Just kind of uh, so do the, do the, um, the um, example from Kahneman, actually, which is that... So here's, this is a, a sort of good sort of interactive experiment. Um, There's a man in the US who uh, is very quiet, keeps himself to himself, sort of shy and retiring, um, uh, very kind of neat and organized. Um, now, on that description of that man, this man lives in the, in the US, who is more likely to be a librarian or a farmer? Hands up for librarian. Hands up for farmer. Why do you think he would be a? Why do you think he would be a librarian? Somebody put their hand up for librarian. Exactly. Yeah. Why do you think he'd be a farmer? Somebody put their hand for farmer. Because he's shy and retiring. If you're a librarian, you're going to be working with people all the time. Oh, that's very interesting. That's not the. That's, that's not the. That's not the book answer. The book answer <laughs> is, is you go for librarian because it's a stereotype, as you say. But actually, it's far more likely to be a farmer because there are far more farmers in the U.S. than there are librarians. So it's, 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 using, it's using the immediate stereotype that comes to mind. Think, ah, oh, hang on a minute, I use this. I think we actually suffer from this a lot in software development, where we come to plan a project and we go, oh, I don't really know what this looks like, Gantt chart. And you go and grab that. You go, to, you go to what's available. You go to the, the, the resources that we've used for hardware or engineering projects and you apply them to that. So what I've done here is we've got the, the, the this is a piece of work we're doing around our, our monitoring systems. <coughs> we've got the why we want it, we want to be sure that our stuff in production works, who's going to help us, uh, give you an example of this thread here through here, um, the, the senior engineers are going to help us, um, how are they going to do that, they're going to fix problems when they arise, um, and we, I added this extra channel here, what information do they need to do, to do this, um, and then what are we going to do, we're going to provide a mechanism that raises a different gear and sends an email to the problem in, in production. So I've taken impact map and then buggered about with it a bit, fit, fit my needs. That then gets turned into this story map, uh, which again is like the, you know, the, the spine at the top. Floating off there. Now we have 17 minutes left, so I could talk a bit about um, skills metrics, if skills metrics, if we go back up to the top and we could do the, the, um, the other bit. Skills matrices. Skills matrices. Cool. So this is um, directly from Chris Matt. Um, and it's uh, the idea is that you get everyone to self-score themselves, self-score themselves, um, to say how adapt are they, or for, for a given project, do they know nothing about it, uh, know the underlying technology, but would need some help with pair or pairing to get up to speed, uh, are familiar, but would need some assistance, or can do it solo. And using this information, when new work comes in, you can look at this and say, right. Uh, we need this to do. Who could, who could do it? Who could, who could be buying this piece of work to to get it done? And you can have a different different policies around that. You could say, oh, we'll give it to the person who knows everything, or you could say, well, let's help and bring some smart and some people up to use the to use John Seddon's words by pairing somebody who does know with somebody who doesn't, and gradually bring them up. I've also cases everyone saying, but for me, I only know a bit about QA of a couple of projects and nothing about anything else. But I I'm in desperate need of some pairing with people to to learn to learn more about the domain. And the reason this came up here was because uh, the engineer who um, designed the, 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 the how for this, his biggest concern was we have live projects that, have, that the team's been disbanded, they're not working on them anymore. How do we, how do we know who's, who's best place to fix it? Well, the skills matrix can tell us. And if we can plug the skills matrix into our monitoring system and say, go and look at the skills matrix, find out who could possibly fix this, and then go and ask them, then hey, we've got some, some, some magic there. Questions on that? 
What's the stop it from being a preference matrix? Uh, you know, I worked on that, but I hated it, so let's try and... Why not? <laughs> no, I mean, why, why not make it? I mean, I'm, I'm very happy with that. I'd rather have, um, you know, I'd rather have people who want to work mm. in, uh, work yeah, rather than yeah. saying, saying, I don't ever, ever, ever want to use these Google APIs ever again. <laughs> um, because, you know, that's, 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 that's very, let's, let's have that conversation. Let's say, okay, all right, well, how, what, would, what would you like to work on? Or, or how, how, can we get, how can we make it so that you've got a, a, better, a better mix? Or, or if you're not going to do it, how can, we, how can we make it so this task is less onerous or less horrible? And yeah, you make it some more underlying thing like, why are you using this? Horrible Google API that's completely undocumented and uninsured. Um, on the flip side of that, what happens if you put, I'd like to learn it across the nation? Anyone tried that as well? So yes, Rachel Davis, that's on the motion that made that. So Rachel Davis has, has talked about her using that in the movie. Really? The really interest stuff, yeah. In order, because they want more cross functional teams. That's a really good idea. I'll um, have that. And so they've got like, a graph <laughs> of, of disinterest to interested and they pair people up who are off like, so they don't get they right, on, right like, like step ops or whatever. They, they choose to Love it. Brilliant, thank you. That's brilliant. That was worth me coming today. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else on this? So it's desperate trying to. See, I'm, really, I'm pushing now, I'm not allowing flow or pull. It's terrible. It takes off maybe the same calm. When you're using the CP based visualization, do you also use some kind of backend system like Jira? Absolutely, how, how yes. Do you keep oh, it yeah, absolutely. So um, I, the way I'd approach this is uh, that. Uh, Jira, is the, Jira is the source of truth uh, because it's the source of the data. Um, and what I'm trying to do here is not replicate that. So I'm not actually interested in the various states that things are going through when they're in progress or whether they're queued or what have you. That's, there's Kanban boards that show that, and Kanban boards are really, really good at doing that. This is the map Mundi. This is, the, this is what the, the, the world looks like. And, it's, and the transactional cost of synchronizing with Jira is very low because all we're saying is, are we, are, are we work, is it done being worked on or? or um, uh, not started. And it's just this is this is more this is again this is a Kahneman thing, the, the system system one, system two. This is something we can go and stand around and poke and say, well look at this one here and I don't really know what's going on here. And all those things you can't do with Jira unless you break the screen off. <laughs> so it's it's you know I I've I have found value from both a, a big physical thing that you can physically engage with and all that and free data. Um, so I like both, and this is my attempt to bring the two together. Anything else? Cool. All right, I think, let me get that quick result. That was in, was that, where were we? Oh, no, we haven't done any work yet. Sorry. That was in Visualize, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, feedback. So just very quickly want to talk about feedback here. So feedback is something we, we got our heads around with Agile from you know, back, in the, back in the 90s, that we can get feedback on our local Activity, so we can use tests to to to, to, to see the direction of our code. Um, and I have the, um, uh, the tests for so there's tests for, for, for what I'm showing you here. So I use these to, to, to guide this and to make sure that it would work and wouldn't explode. I used it here. However, there's a very very great danger that all you're getting here is local optima. That this is ensuring that you're writing some fantastic code that works works well on your machine. Um, but is it related to actually what you're trying to achieve? Is it related to the, the goal? Um, we, we don't know. Um, whoa, this is first explosion. Okay. I've broken something there. Um, yeah, it's broken a Let's get into. This part of the speech, the talk is broken, so I'm going to have to, have to, to back out. What I did want to talk about was um, uh, in the book. Um, the power of habit. So there's a great talk about the. Um, actually, so I can go to the. Uh, let me just go down to the Plan B uh, Low Five version of this, which is Power of Safe Food. I just stick this on the screen. There you go. So in the power of habit, um, Charles t t talks about how the CEO of Alcoa, the, uh, the company that made a lot of the um, aluminium for, for Coca Cola. He came as CEO, and his objective was to bring bring down injury rates, to, to focus on safety, and that became the keystone habit that then enabled a massive wave of transformative change in the organisation. I love this expression, Fred, and this kind of summed up what we're trying to get at with all the Kanban gives you individual responsibility acting on the system. If we bring our injury rates down, it will be because the individuals of this company 
have agreed to be part of something important. So it's, it's, it's saying to people, yes, you're, you're working as individuals, but you're agreed to be part of this whole. There's not a program that's not coming and said, right, we are now going to do X. It's, it's, it's devolved cognition to use uh, Dave, Dave Snowden's uh, example. So, apologies for the. Uh, so that, actually, that's a very good example of how my unit test worked, but there was no integration test. So no test up at the system level. And you know, had, I, had I taken a bit more time, I could have, could have kind of walked over the whole site. We wouldn't have this embarrassment. <laughs> so, which leaves us with 10 minutes to go and limit width. So should we do limit width? Yeah. <laughs> okay, can somebody tell me what this is? A baby. A baby, a lovely baby. Um, who is eating uh, watermelon. Now, the problem with this baby is he's not very mature and he does not aware of the maturity of his capability for eating uh, watermelon. So what he will do is he's given a, uh, an unfettered access to the supply of watermelon to suck it all into his face and it will spew back at him. So what we do is we buffer. So... Um, <laughs> and this is an example of WIP, and WIP stands for? Watermelon in progress, that's what it is. That's a quick question. I hear it called work in process and work in progress. Is that the semantic point? Ask a Kanban professional. But I can't see these guys here. It's just syntax. Yeah. Well, the thing about a lot of the Kanban stuff is, is some of it comes from uh, manufacturing, some of it comes from, from John Sedman, the service stuff, some of it comes from Ryan and pro product development, and we, kind of, we sort of fuse it all together in software and find some of the, some of the again, availability heuristic again. Some of the language is absolutely spot on and perfect. Some of it we, we seek to adapt, and then there's a bit of tension between, oh, that's not the right word. And it's like, yes, but it's the right word for this. Uh, we're in there again. All right, so we've done about width, we've done about taking responsibility. Setting width for this. This is something I found to be the most contentious bit of, of, of putting a Kanban system in place, is when you come to stick the, stick the explicit width limits on. And Chris Mantis is really interesting about this. He actually talks about um, explicit width limits as being something that, that, that undermines options because of the, because of the behavior it, it, it drives. Now, I'm not going to go into that because that's there's, there's some... There's some good resources online about that, and it's, it's a really interesting discussion because what he's saying is not saying he's against limiting width, he's, he's against using explicit width limits. Um, I think that the reason like explicit width limits are hard to hard to hard to introduce, um, oh, and there's a there's a really good if you go and watch the pre-conference talk that Dave Anderson gave about um, sort of proto Kanban and Kanban and talk about the data they have for the small percentage of people that use LeanKit that actually use. With that kind of that kind of fact, facts and stuff that is it's something that people don't get. That don't people think great a camera is the first thing to stick my whip in it. Um, I think there's two aspects to it. One is it it can just appear arbitrary. It's like, well, what number do I use? And you can apply some some, some rules or something, and it may or and something that may emerge. The other is it does have a bit of a top down feeling. It's not like you visualise the work um, and that tells you about what your current working process, process is, but it doesn't tell you what the limit should be. So I think that they, it's it's something that my experience has been something that needs to emerge. Having said that, I found it to be hugely beneficial, particularly when applied to queues. Because if you apply to queues, you get to that's it's the I think it's the it's the it's a very simple mechanism for managing queues. You basically say, by decree, this queue can be no longer than one or two or three. Um, particularly the, the, the review queues, when you've got capacity constrained or non-instant available resource, and, and you, you, you need to ensure that it's actually being used. So, we have, uh, we're very close to the end, so I have to come to the amplify group. So can anyone tell me what this is? It's drawn by a very famous drawing of a rhino by Albert Durer, and it's not drawn from life, it was, um, so I'm going to, I used to be an art historian, um, and in Art and Illusion, which is a really interesting book, it's about the psychology of visual perception. Um, Jura's woodcut is based on second-hand evidence that he then filled in from his own imagination. So he's a very clever guy, a very gifted draftsman, but he drew this based on people telling him, this is what a rhinoceros kind of looks like. Um, what a rhinoceros kind of, kind of looks like is this. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite different, and it's, you can compare the two and see. Now, several hundred years later, after Jura, um, this guy, uh, 17th century, so 18th century, um, 
illustrator drew this and was uh, very proud of it. Said, this is designed from the life. The origins of all the monstrous forms under which the home has ever been painted ever since are Jura's rhinoceros. And it's very painful to say, this is the real deal. This is what a rhinoceros looks like, I'm telling you. Um, it clearly doesn't, because it looks much, much more like this one here and this one here. Again, it's availability um, uh, heuristic, and it's the danger of um, taking things that people stand up and spout on about at conferences and thinking, great, I can use that and find and do this, that, and the other. And I've got a lovely quote from Don Ryerson to finish with. It says this is from Flo, again, a book that I'm battling through at the moment. It's a fantastic book, but my God, it's, it's hardcore. It's very, very good book. Sorry, Dan, you wanted to say something? No, I'll talk to you later about how to read that. I've got a great tip on how to read that book. Really? And, uh, Paul McGinnis. Fantastic. <laughs> Imagine the design factory is an absolute must have. That is a fantastic book. So, he says, this is the end of the introduction. He says, start small and start quickly. Pay attention to feedback, and above all, think about what you're doing. And I'm not trying to be patronizing now. It's really, it's, it's all too often important. It's all too easy to, to think, on. Oh, here's the process, follow the process, and good luck. So that's my parting words to you. So thank you very much for your time. And uh, four minutes left, so if you do want to have a batch of questions at the end, we still can. Any takers? Thank you very much.